Cinema Jaw is brought to you by Overcast. Overcast is an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls, just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store today, and we thank them for their support. Cinema Jaw is also brought to you by Jiffy On Demand. These guys are awesome. They understand stuff's going on in the world right now, but you can still talk to people that can fix things that pop up around your house. Toilets, sinks get backed up, washing machines break, gutters get clogged this time of year. If you need help, Jiffy is available. Their pros have all been advised to practice safe protocols like washing hands before and after jobs, sanitizing equipment, and reassigning the jobs if they are at heightened risk communicating only over the app as opposed to in person as much as possible. Plus, outdoor jobs can still be done without any interaction with another person. Jiffy prides itself on being paperless. So if you want your lawn done, your roof fixed, or your exterior windows washed, all of your walkway power washed, then all you need to do is put it in the app and communicate with your pro. And get this, guys. Jiffy knows they're not going to save the world. But if they can make it so Jawheads have an extra $50 in their pockets during this time, that's what they're going to do. The the code CinemaJaw is now worth $50, and we couldn't thank them enough. We think that's awesome. So if you're in the Chicago area, Jiffy On Demand, and we thank them for their support. Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from our respective homes in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is... Rye the Movie Guy. And this week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we cover our top five movies that take place in New England. Yes, a a subject near and dear to my heart, because as you know, Rye, I grew up in New England. Let's start there, because I'm sure there's a lot of Jawheads, A that aren't from the United States. And there's probably a lot that are in the United States that don't know which states actually make up the region of New England that we're talking about. Did you even know before? I I knew more or less. Uh, I I took a stab and I I, I was correct. Um, I believe we have five states here and the states are Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Yes, and of course I hail from Connecticut, a quaint little village known as New Fairfield, right on the western border by New York. I remember – I mean here's the thing. We're, we're going to be reviewing a movie that takes place in New England, and it has a feel, right? It's different than, say, the south or the midwest. New England has a feel to it, and I myself, being a, a, a midwesterner, had made one trip to – New England. I I flew into Boston, did a few days in Boston, and then rented a car and went up. uh, And this is during the fall when all the leaves are changing. Everybody says you're supposed to do this, right? Yes, yes. That is the absolute truth. The one thing I miss is the fall. Right. So I drove up from Boston. I drove up to uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, then went all the way up to Quebec City, Canada, and then came down the coast of Maine. And and I bring this up because Maine uh, is where the movie we're reviewing takes place. And in your mind, I did anyways, I I pictured Maine as sort of rainy, uh, waves crashing, lighthouses, cold, sort of crappy weather. And and I totally got that when we went there, and I couldn't have been happier. (laughs) It's exactly what I wanted, and I got it. I remember there was a lady walking her dog. She had on a a slicker. I believe that's the term they use. She just had a slicker on. She she seemed so happy, and the rain was coming in sideways, and she was just walking down the street, walking her dog. I got out and took pictures of a lighthouse, and the waves were crashing. I thought, yes, this is Maine. This is New England, indeed, man. I mean, that's that's kind of what it's like. I was a little further inland, but but Connecticut does have a, a pretty interesting coastline down at like the seaport and stuff. It's it's a cool area of of uh, the United States. It sure is. Um, so that movie we're reviewing this week, Matt, is it is called Blow the Man Down. And be careful when you Google this movie. Make sure safe search is turned on. 
But uh, this is kind of a murder mystery crime story, and it's it's a really good movie. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Yep, we're going to review that, and with that, do our top five favorite movies that take place in the New England states. Plus, because we do not have a guest, we're doing this via Skype, we can't play trivia, so we will be doing Stump the Kabinsky. This is where we try to stump Matt K again with three questions, and Jawhead, you'll recall, last week Matt went O for three We'll see how he does on questions four, five, and six this week. I'm feeling I'm feeling a bit more confident this week. Uh, yeah, just just feeling better in general about everything. So hopefully I'll do a little better. We also have Hollywood headlines and let us not forget Matt K. This is our last week to celebrate Pixar Month, which we've been doing all month of March. So let's start there with an interesting Pixar fact. All right, here we go. We continue our celebration of Pixar with this fact. The villain in Up is named Charlie Munz, not so coincidentally, a film producer by the name Charles Mintz is best known for stripping Walt Disney of the ownership rights of his very first successful creation, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, which ultimately drove Disney to create his very own animation studio. Wow, I didn't know that at all. No, that was new to me too, man. That's, that's kind of cool. Interesting it, to find out his motivation. Yep. And I like that uh, Pixar takes sort of like jabs, you know, there's there all these hidden messages with with Pixar. I love that. I know that that got me to thinking, like, if I was to write a story or make a movie like you got to hide all these like hidden little layers into it. You know, it's especially prevalent in animation, I suppose. Yeah. I wonder what you would change the name Rye the movie guy to. I would probably like make you a military guy like major. And then your last name sound like some sort of insult. <laughs> That would make me happy. Yeah, there you go. What would, you, what would, what would you name me? Oh, man. I, I would make you like an object. I, I would have like an animal, like a, a pet hamster named Matt K. There you go. Do you, you, know? do, do you remember – hey, speaking of Pixar, <laughs> do you remember when, when we got into that argument and you told me I looked like a, an alligator and I told you you looked like a penguin and then Phil drew those pictures of us as an alligator and a penguin? <laughs> We got to get those pictures again. I forgot about that. That's I think, awesome. I think I have them somewhere. I'll 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 try to dig them up and put them on Instagram for this episode. But uh, we we also have to get Phil's opinion on Pixar before this month is out. We got to do it. I know we're, we're we're running out of time here, Matt. I know, but you know it's it's been tough. I mean, just a little behind the scenes for the Jawheads. We spent the last hour playing with all these different like remote podcasting platforms and and. Ultimately, we, we just returned to our old standby Skype with free Skype recorder. We we may, may actually get together maybe next week just in one of our respective homes and, and use the Zoom. Maybe. We'll, we'll we'll call that a definite maybe because that, that might be irresponsible of us, Ryan, to, to mm. congregate. This is true. This is true. All right, Matt. It's a jam-packed jaw, so let's get this thing rolling, eh? Yes, please. Let's do. Um, because we have been sort of trapped in our houses and obviously no new movies coming out in theaters, we've been going to these platforms, be it Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, for new movies. And lucky for us, Matt K., there are new movies coming out uh, aplenty, and one of them is entitled Blow the Man Down, and it is streaming on Amazon Prime. It can best be described as a Northeastern noir Maine, to be exact. We have a crime, two sisters, singing fishermen, and some nosy townspeople. Does it add up to an interesting film, or should you throw this catch back into the ocean? Matt and I put on our rain boots, grabbed our fishing gear, and headed to the eastern coastline to find out. In a good seaport town, to me away. Can you start over? I'm confused. It was confusing. But you had to do it right. Oh no. I lost control. <laughs> With a brick. You said it was a harpoon. So what are we gonna do now? <laughs> Should have just called the police. Our story is set in Easter Cove, Maine. We open with a single fishing boat rocking back and forth while some fishermen begin to sing a song, Blow the Man Down. 
Talk about setting the atmosphere up perfectly. Easter Cove is a small town, the kind of town where everybody seems to know everyone and their business. Two sisters, Priscilla and Mary Beth, had their mother pass away. Their future is uncertain. They own a small shop slash restaurant, and the younger sister, Mary Beth, has dreams to go away to college. One night, while Mary Beth is out, she meets a guy at a bar who brings her home. However, the night does not go as anyone would suspect. A murder takes place. Now the sisters have to find a way to cover things up. Like all good noirs, more details float to the surface. How does it all connect? Will they get caught? The answers to these questions is where the fun lies. The story may not be the freshest, but the setting and atmosphere set this apart. I think a comparison would be Fargo as far as that goes, even in regards to the unique townspeople we meet and how they all connect to the crime. It is always a good sign when you finish a movie and in a small way, you feel like you just visited a town you have never been to. I had that with Blow the Man Down. Matt, did you feel like you visited Easter Cove? And if so, did you find your visit as pleasurable as I did? Yes, I felt like I had lived there my whole life, and in a good way. You said that the story is not the freshest, but I have to disagree. What makes the film feel so fresh to me is the absolute reversal of the Bechdel test. Women are at the center of the story, and men are the victims, plot devices, and at best, dupes. Very refreshing. Written and directed by female duo Bridget Savage Cole and Danielle Cruddy, this being their debut, it makes sense that sisterhood and female relationships are at the center of the film. Ryan, you also made a comparison to Fargo. I disagree with that as well. Yes, the movie takes place in a wintry, quaint little fishing town, and that location is central to the plot, but I think a fairer comparison might be Copland. There's a secret society in this little burg, and not the type you would suspect. In fact, it's that secret cadre of crime, and who exactly runs it, that made the movie feel very different from anything I'd seen before. Call it the Blue Hair Mafia. Senior citizen women run brothels and swig whiskey between knitting and making homemade greeting cards. And I found that take to be very fresh indeed. Rye, do you agree? Do Bridget Savage Cole and Daniel Cruddy have a successful reversal of Bechdel? Did that make it feel fresher or is this a frozen fish? Oh, fresher all the way. And this is not a frozen fish. I agree with you. Okay. I love how they flip the gender script here, but that's not all. The only thing that's fresh in this movie, there's other elements here that make it feel fresh as well. I mean, I mentioned the singing fisherman. Yes. But we we haven't talked about the score in general. I mean, the score is fantastic, right? Fantastic. It it raises the, the tension when it needs to. I absolutely loved it. And the cast, this overall cast of characters that populate the town, the sisters, Margot Martindale uh, is, is a lady who runs the brothel. The entire cast is great. I loved everything about it. It's like a grumpy old men. If, if the grumpy old men were, were sort of running a, a crime syndicate and when you find out why things are the way they are in the town and how the people that are in power got to be in power and exactly how far they'll go to protect certain elements of what they have, it's it's pretty refreshing in, in the character choices. Sure. I mean, I think when we first meet the older ladies in town, and there's three in particular that are sort of walking down the street when they see this uh, younger woman come sort of scantily clad, you know, short short dress on, she's walking, and they make a comment, I thought for sure – these three older ladies were just going to be comic relief and sort of side characters to this overall crime that's been committed. But, oh, no, they're a major plot point in the in the film, and that's very refreshing. It is. And, and as we learn more and more about them and, and exactly how deep their relationships go and how uh, entwined all the tendrils of this crime are – it's it's just it's interesting because it's not the things you would suspect when you meet nice little old ladies in a quaint New England town. So it's it sort of it, it was refreshing in that way very much. Yeah, I love the idea of having a brothel inside a bed and breakfast. And the first time that we actually go inside this bed and breakfast, we hear the sounds 
of you know some noisy sex going on, I still didn't put it together that this was going to be a brothel. I just thought this was going to be you know it was funny hearing the sounds coming from right. upstairs because that's that happens in a regular bed and breakfast too. <laughs> right. But all of a sudden, this turns into a this quaint town with a, a bed and breakfast, and and it's actually a brothel. It's pretty hysterical. I loved it. It is, and and the the way that everybody kind of knows about it. The way the cops deal with things in the town, the way that the, the men who work the, the seaport tie into everything, it's just a big twisted web that these two sisters find themselves ensnared in. Delightful. It's, it, it was a fun noir. I think that's an accurate description. Another thing I wanted to highlight was for first time directors here was their confidence on really creating some scenes with high tension. And this was like a shot of panic that goes through Mary Beth's character when she opens up the trunk uh, of uh, one of the characters and she sees, you know, some suspicious stuff. The the whole scene sort of goes like almost like slow for just a, a, a brief like three seconds. And you see her reaction that she knows you know, something isn't right here. This isn't good. And from that point on all the way to uh, the climax of this particular scene, that was so enjoyable. And, and I didn't know. I was worried about Mary Beth. I didn't know what was going to happen. I love that entire scene. I love both of the sisters quite a bit. Uh, Priscilla, who sort of struggles with what is the right thing? How does she protect her sister? Is she this big responsible person or is she more like the person she discovers her mom truly was that was amazing and talk about confident filmmakers the shots of the water and the lighthouses and the way that they put people into this town and the landscape was there was some truly beautiful cinematography as well yeah i mean i know it's been sort of an abbreviated film year here but i'm i'm not joking here jawheads this was one of my favorite movies i've seen so far in in 2020 yeah, me too. Uh, just an incredible ending, too. I, I, I agree with you, Ryan. This one is one of my favorites so far this year. You got a movie poster quote for me? I do. Prostitutes, murder, drugs, salty sea dogs, and sweet little old ladies. <laughs> that's a movie I want to see right there. That's a good movie poster quote. I see that. I'm like, yeah, I want to see what that's all about. Uh, I went with and, and I believe I've seen this on a, a sales ad at Dick's Sporting Goods, and I just stole it and put it on this movie poster. It just says, you can never have a big enough cooler. That is a fact, bro. That is a fact. <laughs> How many jaws on this one, Matt K? I'm giving this one 3.5 jaws, three and a half. And, and honestly, it, it might go up as time wears on. I'm with you. Three and a half Jaws, I, I, I think, as well. I had so much fun with it. It was a, a movie that the next day after I watched it, I was thinking about. And that's always such a good sign, right? Right. I think the reason I didn't give it the fourth, the, the full four Jaws is because I kept comparing it in my mind to a Knives Out. And it's not quite a Knives Out. It's, it's not quite that clever. But it's a smaller film. It's less ambitious. And what it does accomplish uh, in its storytelling is quite proficient, especially the ending. I think people will find very satisfying. Yeah. And I think my comparison to Fargo is fair because I was, I'm trying to compare it in the sense of it's, it's a noir in a small town with, you know, these unique townspeople. And I think your comparison of, of Copland because of more of the plot wise comparison is also fair. I think if you take all of that and, and you, mash it together. I think that gives the jawheads an idea of what blow the man down is all about. I'll give you that for sure. That's, that's accurate. So since we're covering our new England uh, movies here, how did blow the man down do? I, I think obviously quite well because we watched this movie and that's what we came away with was talking about other movies that take place in new England. I think that is because blow the man down did such a good job of establishing that atmosphere and the setting of a New England state, uh, be it Maine this time around, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, plenty of lobster, plenty of seafood right there on the coast. Even even further inland, you feel that influence of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, New England is very much a port area. Sure. I mean, there, there's a scene in Blow the Man Down where they are filleting. Is that what, what the term when, when you cut fish open? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm no fishmonger, but I believe that's the term. And they're, they're, they're cutting these fish and they're, they're, they're gutting them. And it's just a couple of quick scenes. And it's, it's like, oh, I, I could never do that. But 
if you're a New Englander, you know, you're somebody from Maine that does this, they're doing it like just – they could just do it like filling up a glass of water. Well, it's just no issue for them. These are skills that come in handy when when uh, when murder is the, uh, the order of the day, the catch of the day. This is true. Uh, so – Matt and I, both big fans of Blow the Man Down, do check it out. It's on Amazon Prime. And let us know what you thought. Shoot us an email, feedback at cinemajaw.com, or you can always write us on Twitter as well. We are at Cinemajaw. That got us thinking, our top five favorite movies set in New England. And Matt, Bean from Connecticut, I'll let you go first. Oh, well, since we're talking about Connecticut, I'll start right there, Ryan. At number five, I have a movie that is an old-timey classic, and I think it would warm the hearts of Jawheads who are looking for something a little different. It is a musical starring the great Bing Crosby, who most people today, including my kids, would probably be most familiar with his work on Christmas carols. Unfortunately, that's where most people probably know Bing, Bing Crosby from, but he was a great actor in A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. I don't know if I've ever seen this movie. Really? True story. Uh, well, listen, it's it's from the 50s, so bear that in mind when you watch it. But it's a Technicolor classic musical starring Bing Crosby based on a Mark Twain story of the same name about a salesman who – or maybe he's a mechanic, I forget. But anyway, a, a working class guy who bumps his head and wakes up in King Arthur's court hundreds of years ago. So he he knows he's got all the the um, the modern knowledge of a, of a man living today, and he wakes up in medieval times, and he can use matches and other technology. So he quickly integrates into their um, society and gets some status. Falls in love with someone he shouldn't fall in love with, and you know wackiness ensues. It's a classic movie, and it takes place in Connecticut. Well, it starts off in Connecticut, and then obviously it goes to King Arthur's Court. Hence. <laughs> Hence the name. All right. I guess it's a New England movie. It's not probably what I had in mind when we were coming up with this well, list. Well, you know what? It's right it's there in the title. Right. There's not too many movies with Connecticut in the title. So <laughs> there you go. All right. For my number five, I go back to uh, the year 2000. The director here is David Mamet. It's a comedy that I remember I, I saw and I, I really liked this film and I, I'm doing the research and getting ready for this. It was a film that I realized I got to watch again because the cast is fantastic in it. The film is called State Maine. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you brought this up. And it's great. It's actually about the production of a, f a fictional film called The Old Mill. They're shooting in Waterford, Vermont. They, they need to go to Waterford, Vermont because – it's billed as having this old mill. So they bring this whole production there. And once they get there, they find out that the mill had burned down like decades earlier. But that was just what the, the town had prided themselves on was that they did have this old mill at one time. They still go on, obviously, making the movie. I don't want to call it a screwball comedy, but it, it's borderline. You got the director of this uh, fictitious film is played by William H. Macy. The rest of the cast, too. You have Alec Baldwin in there, Sarah Jessica Parker, Philip Seymour Hoffman. It's quality. It's quality film. I mean, the cast alone is very intriguing. I've still never caught up with this movie, and you're like the 800th person to recommend it to me. It, it's a good one. You got to see this one. I really do, especially if it's a screwball comedy. I'm, I'm in the mood for some of that. That swings it back to me. At number four, I, I talk about this movie often, but it's been a while since I've brought it up on the jaw. And it is, I guess I would call it a horror movie, but it's more of a psychological thriller, perhaps. It stars a very young Macaulay Culkin and a very young Elijah Wood. It's very New England, right on the ocean, and I believe it's set in Maine. And I'm talking about The Good Son. From mm -hmm. 1993. Yeah. Now, this is a film, when you say it, I know it's set in New England. I just know that it is. It has that feeling. Yeah, it really does. Especially once they start playing in the woods, which is an experience I, I had growing up. That's what we did as kids. We just went out in the woods and started fires and chopped down trees and things like that. We did not throw mannequins out onto the highway like Macaulay Culkin's character does and such a great performance from two very young very talented actors who would go on to do some pretty amazing things so that's a good one it's harrowing it's stuck with me all these years I still find it disturbing I haven't seen it in a long time I, I can't say disturbing but 
I do like the film. My number four pick, a film I have brought up a couple of times, came out back in 1981. This was a, a family favorite. My parents loved it, and I, because of that, saw it numerous times growing up as a kid. And when I think of New England, you also have to think of the fact that there's a lot of people like in New York that have summer homes up in upper New England. So they have summer homes in like New Hampshire and Vermont and, and such. And that's the case in the setting for 1981's On Golden Pond. I still haven't seen this one either. This one stars two absolute legends here, Catherine Hepburn and Henry Fonda. And this was Henry Fonda's last role. And he won the Academy Award for actor. So you can't go out better than that, right? I mean, last role, and, and he wins the uh, Oscar. They play an older couple who return to their summer home, and obviously they've been going up to their summer home every time uh, to open it up. And it's in upper New England, and it's on the, the lake called Golden Pond. Their daughter is actually played by uh, Henry Fonda's true life daughter, Jane Fonda. And this particular summer, she has a new fiancé, and he has a son and she wants to leave that son with her parents at the summer home. And she thinks it's good for her dad, you know, to sort of, you know, teach him fishing and all that good stuff. Yeah. And, of course, a, a bond with this teenage son and, and the old grumpy, old stubborn Norman, you know, happens. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful moment. Um, what I came to find out doing the research for this is that uh, Henry Fonda, as of making this movie, Henry Fonda – and Catherine Hepburn had not only never worked together, but had never even met until making the movie. And on the first day of shooting, Catherine Hepburn presented Henry Fonda with her longtime companion, Spencer Tracy's lucky hat. And that's the hat that Henry Fonda wears in the film. And I know people who have seen On Golden Pond, it's an iconic hat. And he actually wears it in the movie. The other fact here is that Hepburn, who was 74 at the time of making the film, performed all her own stunts in the movie. And this is not an action movie, but there is a sequence in which she has to dive into the pond. And that actually is Catherine Hepburn diving into the pond at 74 years old. So I give her all the credit for that as well. Jeez. Hell yeah. That's that's amazing. I, I, I got to see this one. It, it, it's a tearjerker. And it was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And the other startling fact was it was the, the second highest grossing film of 1981 behind Raiders of the Lost Ark. What a wow. time we used to live in. You had Raiders of the Lost Ark the highest grossing film, and after that, a, a drama that nowadays wouldn't come in the top probably 100 if this was released. But back then, audiences went to it and, and went to it quite often on Golden Pond. Well, they had fewer choices back then, though. Hmm. Stop bringing down my movie, damn it, Mackay, on Golden <laughs> Pond. All right. Uh, you and Catherine Hepburn. Uh, all right, that swings it back to me. And this is where I put a movie from just last year, Ryan. 2019 was a hell of a year in film. That is no exception with the fine Greta Gerwig and her movie set in Massachusetts, Little Women. Yes, honorable mention for me, yes. The parameters I sort of used to build my list were how New Englandy are the movies that we're going to talk about. I, I tried to stay away from major metros like Boston and, and uh, you know some of the other big towns in New England. Like New Haven, I guess. After Boston, it gets already pretty small town. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. But I mean, like Yale movies, things like that. I, I, but this is so rustic, and it is that New England feeling of like your your neighbor is like you know a, a few hundred yards away from you, but you're still so close. They're almost like family. Just the the way that they build this world in this town. And, of course, it's around Christmas. I don't know why, but fall and Christmas in particular always feel so New England to me. So, yeah, I mean, Little Women is a great movie for many, many reasons, but the New Englandiness of it is not the least of them. I do love the setting of that, and I love the the fact that you point out that neighbors are, are far apart, but you're, you're almost family. I like the way it's presented in Greta Gerwig's adaptation. Yeah, I agree. And I did subsequently watch, because I was really curious after we went and saw the new one, the, the Winona Ryder version of it, which I thought was actually really, really good. But what I think is just somewhat missing is some of the 
the character building that that they were able to to do, and and some of the New Englandiness of it, honestly. Nice pick. Uh, my number three film. I couldn't not put this on a top five list if I'm a big Wes Anderson fan and he's made one movie set very wholeheartedly in New England. It should be represented. And I'm speaking of the 2012 Moonrise Kingdom. Have you seen this one yet, Matt? No, man. I'm I'm seriously remiss. I don't think I've seen any of your movies yet. I know. This is terrible. I think I, we may go 0 for 5 because I'm looking at my number 2 and 1. I don't think you've seen them either. So Moonrise Kingdom, uh, Wes Anderson is absolutely, you know, it's, it's as Wes Anderson as you can get. you got Sam and Susie, young lovers falling in love on the island. It's a, a small island on, you know, in New England. And because this is a Wes Anderson film, you get to know the island. He's always got to show you exactly what's going on, where everything's at. That's part of the beauty of it. And when a storm in particular, which is a huge plot point in the movie, is coming through, you have to know exactly with what's going on on this, this island. And it, it really rains through because they do get some powerful storms when you're right on the coastline there. And one just happens to come through in the climax scene of Moonrise Kingdom. You got to see this one, Matt. I'll bring over the Blu-ray when we record together next week. All right. Sounds good, man. I'll I'll be uh, interested to see it. If there's one movie on your list that I have to see, this is the one. Oh, it's it's fantastic. Ed Norton in in a Wes Anderson, you know, you got Bill Murray. Doesn't get much better than that. All right. Harvey Keitel. Harvey Keitel. It's great. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the very few Wes Anderson movies I haven't seen, so. All right, I'm in. That swings it back over to me and my number two. And this is where I put a movie that you probably could have guessed was going to be on my list. Set in 1630s New England. You can't talk about New England, Ryan, and not talk about witches. Mm, mm. This is the movie that that put A24 on my map and absolutely sort of blew the lid off of new horror for for the the post-aughts. And I'm talking about The Witch. Ah, oh, yeah. Robert Eggers, and I just love this movie. It, it is so creepy. It's such a slow burn that rises up, and it is it is New England because of the witch thing. I mean, we'll we'll never get away from the the Salem witch trials, and you can you can go to New England and find so many like haunted attractions on the side of the road that talk about witches and this and that. I believe the Blair Witch Project was also set in New England. It's just part of our lore out there in the woods and everything else. It's creepy. And the witch captured that creepiness with almost no real, like, on-screen horror. It was all mm-hmm. atmosphere. Such a great movie. Sure was. I, I still think back to seeing that movie in the theater, and for some reason a, a mom brought, like, a seven-year-old girl to go see it, and <laughs> they were sitting a couple rows in front of me, and this was – you know, like a Saturday morning, I want to say. I don't know what they were thinking, but I just remember she was just bored. And then at the end, because it is so creepy near the end, she was just scared out of her mind. Definitely not a movie to bring a seven-year-old <laughs> to. Yeah, for sure. But one of my favorites, The Witch. Yep. His follow-up, The Lighthouse, also streaming now, I believe, on Amazon Prime. The Witch is streaming. So a couple of good ones to, to check out. Yeah, watch them both. My number two film came out in 2016, won an Academy Award for Casey Affleck. I am speaking of Manchester by the Sea. Yes. And did you know, Matt, that Manchester by the Sea is the name of the town? Maybe you know this. I I did know that. And that's actually where they filmed some of The Good Son, was right in Manchester by the Sea. Mm -hmm. So I I knew this also, having, you know, worked with maps and logistics in my time, I knew the town Manchester by the sea, but I was shocked how many people when I tell them, well, that's the name of the town is Manchester by the sea. How confusing that is for people. They don't think that that's the name of the city. Well, wouldn't you just call it Manchester, you know? Right, exactly. But it's called Manchester by the sea. Um, And we have Casey Affleck, who plays Lee, who gets word that his brother died, and he lives at the time in, I I believe, uh, Boston, and he has to go to Manchester by the Sea to – you know, take care of the funeral arrangements and all the the stuff that goes with that. And at that time, he finds out 
that he is now the legal guardian of his brother's son, Patrick, who's played by Lucas Hedges. From there, because he's now in this small town in, in Massachusetts, we find out that this is where he lived also for some time with his wife, who was played by Michelle Williams and their three daughters. And we find out the horrors and the sadness of what happened to him and his time and and why he's so afraid to go back to this town and, and relive these memories. It's a heartbreaking story, fantastically acted by both Casey Affleck and Michelle Williams. You cannot watch Manchester by the Sea and, and not have tears come out of your eyes. You just can't. It's It's emotionally just extremely moving. We had a few Oscars come out of that film, did we not? It sure did. It's a great one. It is. I don't think you've seen it. Oh, for five. So, yeah, I, I I don't think you've seen my number one either. So here we go. I think you've probably seen my number one, Ryan, because it is one of the greatest movies of all time, and a movie that I am proud to say takes place in New England, Amity Island. Do you already know which movie I'm well, talking about? Here we go. This is technically not New England if it's New York. No, this is New England. This this takes place in New England. 1975 Jaws. Oh, Jaws. Okay. I thought you were for some reason going the Amityville Horror. No. Amityville oh. Horror is also totally New England, dude. I guess. Is I, it but New I York? thought it was New York. I think it's New York. That's where I thought you were going. I thought Amityville was in Connecticut. We'll look that up. We'll throw it in a jaw box, and one of us will look it up since we don't have Pat. But okay, right. you went we'll, Jaws. We'll look it up during the break. But one way or another, I've actually been to the Amityville house, and it is really, really creepy. Maybe it was in New York. Like I said, I lived right on the border. But Jaws, yeah. I mean, I, I, we don't need to wax poetic on Jaws. It's one of the greatest movies of all time. Steven Spielberg, set in New England, in a very unlikely place for a shark to terrorize. People study this movie in film class. All of the Jawheads are infinitely familiar with it, so I feel like I don't have to pontificate too too much on Jaws, but it, it needs to be mentioned on this list. Love it. Um, my number one film, and I went with a film that I wanted the atmosphere of New England, the way we're discussing it, to have shine through in the film. And I went with a movie that came out in 2010. It's directed by Roman Polanski. It is entitled The Ghost Writer. I always make sure I say the ghost writer, not ghost writer. And in the ghost writer, Ewan McGregor is hired uh, by a publishing firm to complete the autobiography of the former prime minister of Britain, who's played by uh, Pierce Brosnan. And it turns out that the, the writer's person who was trying to do his memoir prior to Ewan McGregor coming on board was killed. At the time, we hear that he just died. But once he gets to uh, Martha's Vineyard, which is in Massachusetts. Ah, yes. Yes, it is. He gets there and he finds out that, uh, you know, the, this guy died. And why did he die? Well, he was writing this guy's memoir. Uh, it starts to become very noir-esque. And the fact that the character of uh, that Pierce Brosnan plays this former prime minister can't return to – uh, England because he's uh, on charges of war crimes that may have happened having to do with uh, terrorists and whatnot. All of it turns into like a political thrill, thriller slash noir, very New England set. I, at one point he gets in a car that is like set to drive somewhere with navigation and he doesn't know where exactly he's going. And it's it when he's going and he's driving, it's so – that New England setting where you're sort of freaked out, it's tough to say, but the weather, the rain, the wind, everything about it is New England. And it makes a scary and sort of tension-filled atmosphere. I love it. It's a really fun part of the country, man. I'm, I'm glad we got to cover it. Yeah. Any honorable mentions for you, Matt Kay? I, I have a few, yes. Uh, one in particular that we have to talk about is... One Crazy Summer. With John Cusack. The John Cusack <laughs> movie. It's about, uh, you know, it's a typical, like, underdog sports movie, but the sport in question is boat racing. It's a regatta, of all things. Mm -hmm. And it's, which is just totally New England in and of itself. Hoops. I mean, <laughs> you got to see One Crazy Summer. Bobcat Goldthwait. Yep. It's, it's amazing. You uh, know, another... 
Another movie that did it pretty well, I thought the the atmosphere anyways, was Shutter Island with Leonardo DiCaprio. For sure. Especially early on when they're like traveling to the prison, that, that all that, you know, that boat, that, the, the way it all works, you yep. know? Yep. The rain, the atmosphere, um, all the Stephen King movies, it and all the other ones, really, every single one, um, Shawshank Redemption, every last one of them, uh, Clue. Is another one said it, they don't really specifically say exactly where it's set, but it's a very New England style mansion. So my last one is Charlie. Do you remember that movie? I don't. It's from the like 60s, maybe early 70s, based on Flowers for Algernon about uh, a guy who is uh, sort of um, becomes a savant. He's like mentally challenged and then he gains super intelligence, but then loses it. It's really sad. It was it's a really good movie. If you get a chance, mm. you should check it out. Nice. Uh, the only one then not mentioned that I still have as an honorable is a film entitled In the Bedroom, which was a smaller movie starred uh, Sissy Spacek, Tom Wilkinson, and has a New England setting where uh, their son is, I, I believe, killed by um, – he, he's like dating a, a woman who was married but is divorced, and I think it's it, that – ex-husband ends up killing their son and then they decide to sort of take matters in their own hands very new england woods scariness you just made me think of cape fear was that one down south or was that new england i think that's new england also could be we'll check in my that one mind up. the setting is new england we'll throw that in the jaw box as well all right cool we got a couple facts in there Good stuff. All right. What we're going to do is take a break. When we come back, we still have some Hollywood headlines and the second round, if you will, of Stump the Kabinsky. Matt K gets three questions. Try to answer any one of the three correct. He's 0 for 3 so far. Stick with us, Jawheads. into the so-called jaw box, even though there's nobody here to look it up. And let me just tell you, it's hard labor when when you're doing the podcast and, and you have to look up the facts I yourself. I know. we got to get um, Pat back on next week. We do. Uh, true story, Jawheads, after we, we stopped there and we got to break, we were like, wait, what did we ask it to throw in the jaw box? We had yeah. to remember. <laughs> got to jot this stuff <laughs> down. When you were talking, yeah. Yeah, you got to write this stuff down. One of them was, does Cape Fear take place in New England? And I was so sure that it did. Absolutely, it does not. It is the south. It's Georgia uh, down there off of, uh, like, southeast Georgia down by Savannah and such. Yeah, I thought it might be. But, I mean, when you hear the word Cape, you immediately think of, like, a Cape Cod, something like that. So Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen that one. The other question was Amneville. I believe was it is it in New York and it is in New York technically not part of the New England states technically not but it's it's really almost an honorable New England state there's there's very little difference between a rural New York and a rural Connecticut mm -hmm. if there was another question jawheads that we threw in there we forgot it I don't think there was but if there was <laughs> I don't know there there might have been you know it's Could it's be. tough stuff what Pat does Sorry. I didn't realize yeah. How difficult Pat's job was. It's a blur. We need a, we need Pat, God damn it. Get him back. <laughs> While we're in this little uh, jaw box segment, thought it'd be a good time to announce our film that we're reviewing next week. Because we'll probably be doing this, should say, more than likely we'll be doing this again via Skype next week. So we're going to pick another movie that came out on Netflix, and that is The Platform. Yes. And interestingly enough, uh, I've already seen it, and... Can't wait to discuss it, so there's a hint for you. But uh, this actually played at Toronto. Go back last September when I was in Toronto. People had saw it and were talking about it, and I had not saw it then, but was had it written down in my journal since last September to check out the platform. And now here it is, streaming on Netflix. That is wow. going to be our review next week. And this sort of uh, is a timely story in a way, right? Or at least 
like coincidentally lines up with current events in a way. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, not not too much. I don't want to read that too too much into it. Um, we'll discuss it next week. Fair, okay. We'll discuss it next next week. All right. I guess that brings us to Hollywood headlines, Ryan. Uh, I'm very excited to share one with you here. This one is about No Time to Die's Daniel Craig. Have you heard of this guy? Daniel Craig explains why his kids won't inherit his bond money. So he's not going to be giving his kids any money. Here's the quote from the article. I don't want to leave great sums to the next generation. I think inheritance is quite distasteful. My philosophy is to get rid of it or give it away before you go. <laughs> Thanks, you Dad. Know, there's, yeah, but there's there's a there's a lot of people that are in that camp, or at least uh, they weigh in on the the sense that they're not going to give their complete fortune to their kids. You know, I think it, it comes. You know, there's some people that probably come from nothing and earn something and don't feel the need to give it to their kids, but that the kids should do the same that, that they did. And that's what built them the character that they have. Well, listen, I'm not in favor of nepotism and, and I don't think like, you know, old money is a good thing either, but like if you get wealthy, you should set your kids up, maybe send your grandkids to college, something, you know, right. It's kind of a dick move. <laughs> It is, but I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it, is he a 100% not going to give them, or is it just, hey, we're not going to give you millions. We'll take care of you. You don't really know. I guess we don't know the exact details of, of what he is or isn't leaving his kid, but he felt strongly enough to make this a big uh, quote, in, and it's making headlines, Ryan. Oh, he's James Bond. Everything he does is going to make headlines right now. Yeah, fair enough. And and Benoit Blanc. Let's, let's not forget. <laughs> Can't wait till we get another one of those movies. Um, so, all right. So you know this guy, David Ar Arbor, who is the star of Stranger Things? Oh, sure. And he he was also the new face of Hellboy. Now, he came out recently and said that Hellboy's failure – and I'm talking about the rebooted Hellboy that came out last year. He said that Hellboy's failure was primarily due to fans of Guillermo – del toro and his movies who were angry about the reboot and that's why his movie failed uh i mean it is a tough act to follow those those ron perlman hellboys were actually really really good so i i don't know if that's a fair statement on his part no yeah i mean i i, I agree that there's going to be fans that are going to love the movie but i believe let's be honest if that rebooted hellboy came out and was absolutely awesome people wouldn't hold it against it because it was a reboot. People would, would champion the film. You know yeah, how it is. I do. It, it wasn't good enough for fans to, to latch on to. That's no. plain and simple. Plain and simple, yeah. So the, he's saying it's Guillermo trolls that are, that are the reason why the movie wasn't successful. I say boo-hoo. It wasn't the trolls. It was because the movie just wasn't that good. Exactly. I agree with you. And one other note here, since we're streaming at home all these movies – it's interesting that a, a couple weeks ago, Netflix added a top 10 list to the site. Maybe you've seen it. I'm sure the Jawheads have. This is basically on the homepage now. It shows the overall top 10 of what's popular. So it's oh, sort of yeah. their way of saying, hey, this is the top 10 most streamed things. And on the homepage, it's everything. So it could be television and movies. And then it's broken up into two tabs. So you could see the top 10 movies streamed and top 10 television movies streamed. I like it in a way because it's in, I don't know why it is, but we're always fascinated with like box office, right? Yeah. What's so trending? Yeah. The one at the box office that always makes news. But now that watching, you know, streaming services, what's number one? Oh, it's interesting to see that Spencer Confidential, when I last looked yesterday, was still in the top 10, you know, two, three weeks now. It's, it's hanging on at like number nine of the most popular things streamed. I, I like seeing that kind of stuff. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I, I like seeing that kind of stuff too. It's it's very interesting to know what uh, is popular. I mean, that's why all those services like YouTube and Twitter, they all have like a little what's trending section. And it just makes sense. But the big question is, have you seen The Tiger King yet, Ryan? I I have not. Have you? No. I think I'm going to binge it uh, like tomorrow. <laughs> I've been binging too many movies. 
Uh, me too. And I, I got there's a bunch of movies I have to catch up on, but I think the Tiger King is next on my queue, man. I think I got to watch this. You can almost so consider one, it a movie at this point, right? That's what I, I, I who knows? I, everything's blending together now. But but speaking of these features on the uh, various streaming sites, I, I wanted to note there's two that I really want done. So if anybody is working at Netflix or Amazon Prime, here's what I want to see done. I want to see a little date on when a movie is. So there's a lot of movies uh, that are not, say, Netflix originals. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it could be, you know, whatever the movie is, but it wasn't necessarily produced by Netflix or Amazon Prime. And they're on there only for a certain amount of time and then they leave. Oh, so, so when the movie's going to expire. Right. of On that website. Now, I was watching a television show where it was a, a, a series. It was a, a 10 part series that I started near the end of the month and I was three episodes in and this was on Amazon Prime. The month flipped. I went to go watch episode four. The series was gone. Oh, it man. Wasn't on, that would, it wasn't on there anymore. That would piss me off. That would piss yeah, me and, off. And so I was like, for now on, you have to put a date on when this is, is leaving. I think it just makes sense, right? If anything, it, it, it would, would just make people watch it more, right? Right. It, it, you would be like, oh, boy, this is leaving in, in two weeks. I better check it out. I think they should do that. And then – for the uh, all those sites, or I should say, all those services that are doing movies with ads, like Vudu, Crackle, Tubi, all these, they're, they're popping up left and right as well. How about this? Runtime with the movie, and then in parentheses, runtime with the ads, because I need to know these things. I, I'm looking at a movie; it's hour and forty minutes long. Is it going to be an hour and fifty if I sit down and watch it with your ads? I'm willing to sit down, but tell me how much longer I'm committing to. You know what I mean? I agree totally. Yeah. The, why? Why mislead us? Why spoon feed us? Just tell it to us straight. I it's agree. That's the what nerve we want. of these people. The nerve. We want the facts. Hell yeah, we do. All right. Speaking of the facts, it is time to stump the Kabinsky. Three questions to stump Matt K. And I was joking earlier, Matt went on a, a run for goods, rations, uh, earlier this week. He, he was running low. His family was running low. We didn't know what was going to happen to the Kabinskis over there, trapped in their, their, their little uh, rabbit hole there in Rogers Park. And he said, I got to go to the store. And, and I thought to myself, I wonder how many beers Matt K picks up when he runs to the store. Now, I know – the facts and the facts are this he drinks paps blue ribbon and paps blue ribbon comes in 30 packs so we got to go by 30 here so you could either go 30 60 90 or 120 and all things considering his wife if if he comes home with 120 his wife's yelling at him what the hell are you buying that much beer for if i come home with 30 my wife's yelling at me (laughs) so i figure there's no way no way there's 120, unless maybe he's burying some in the backyard. So I thought I would take a stab and say how many you bought, uh, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you bought 90 beers. No, no. Take take it down, one 130 pack. I, I went ahead and bought two. I went ahead and bought the 60, man. You know, I was only going to buy the one, but you you got to double up in these times, right? Because you don't know oh, when you're sure. going to be able to go out again. Frankly, I don't want to go out again. I want to. I want to make my trips to the store as as few and far between as possible. So I stocked up, Ryan. But I've been making it last. You know, practicing moderation. All right. I. I. I maybe there, there's a thirty pack buried in your backyard, and you're afraid that your wife is listening to this podcast, and that's why you said you only came home with sixty. Uh, you know what? Maybe we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out in about. Uh, 20 days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Time to play some Stump the Kabinsky. Three questions we ask Matt K, and we see if he can answer these three. Matt went 0 for 3 last week. We start off with question one. I tried to make them a little bit easier so that maybe oh, uh, you get an answer right here. Don't patronize me. Make, make them hard. Come on. Let's go. All right. Question one. Star Wars movies. All, all the Star Wars movies are in consideration – that are live action, so not counting uh, the Clone Wars movie, but all the others. What about the Christmas special? No, not in, not okay. in consideration okay. either, but all the main live action movies. Got it, got it. What, 
Star Wars movie has the shortest runtime. Oh, man. I mean, like, who the hell knows facts like this? Really? I mean, seriously, Ryan, who who sits there? Even even Star Wars nerds that I know, and I know quite a few, probably don't know the answer to this question. I am friends with this guy named Ray. And every time I go to a convention, it could be any convention. It could be a, 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 a freaking knitting convention. He will be dressed up as a stormtrooper somewhere at that convention. So, oh, man, I have to say it's probably one of the original t- trilogy. And I'm going to go with not Empire Strikes Back and not New Hope. It's it's the Return of the Jedi. Damn it. Incorrect, Matt Kay. <laughs> we were looking for A New Hope. You really? were right that it was. <laughs> yeah. It clocked in at 121 minutes, A New Hope. I mean, I, that makes sense because it was their first movie. They didn't have as much money. They shot it on film, so it would have to be shorter. But I thought that it was such an epic story. It just feels longer in my mind. I don't know. Hmm. Um, so, yes, A New Hope, 121 minutes. On to question two. Are you ready for this one, man? I'm, I'm ready. Leonardo DiCaprio. You know this guy? Never heard of him. His highest grossing film is Titanic. But what comes after that? What is the second highest grossing film? So really take away Titanic, as we know it's one of the biggest movies of all time. What is the second highest grossing Leonardo DiCaprio film? Wow. Wow. He's made so many movies. I'm Okay, so it's probably The Wolf of Wall Street. That's my guess, because that was just an absolute juggernaut. It was a big Scorsese hit. I'm trying to think if there's any others that jump into my mind, like maybe when he was young. It's not like a What's Eating Gilbert Grape or Basketball Diaries or something like that. It's definitely one of the bigger bombastic, ooh, maybe like The Aviator. That could be another one that was a big hit. I'm going to go with Wolf of Wall Street, though. I'm sticking with it. Another incorrect... Had the wrong director here because you think he's worked with Martin Scorsese so many times. But no, it was asked, actually Christopher Nolan and Inception. 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 Okay. All right. Inception grossed $830 million. Um, it's not my quite, favorite. Quite the big one. It's not my favorite Nolan movie. I know it's one of yours, but oh, man, I wouldn't have guessed it. Yeah. Matt K. now, uh, if you're counting at home, 0 for 5 over the two-week span. Here we go, Matt. you got to get this one right. And it's the toughest question of the night. No pressure. Yeah. All right. Let's go. All right. Composer John Williams. He made such great scores as Star Wars, E.T., Jaws, Superman, Raiders of the Lost Ark, just to name a few. How many Oscars has he won? Well, I mean, he wins every three years, right? Every time there's a new Star Wars movie, they pretty much hand him an Oscar. Although not not at this last one, famously. I would guess... He's probably got at least eight Oscars, maybe more. So uh, let's say a dozen. Let's say he's got 12 Oscars. This guy's got 12 Oscars. Another incorrect for you, Matt How how far off was I? Five. He has five Oscars. Damn. Here's his – he, he's only won one for one of the Star Wars films, and that was the original Star Wars. Really? That's it? Yeah. Here, here's what he won for. Star Wars, Schindler's List, E.T., Jaws, Fiddler on the Roof. Those are all That's really it. great, really great compositions right there. But, I mean, this guy also did Harry Potter, Jurassic Park. I mean, all of the themes that we know, you know, are, are John Williams. He did Harry Potter. Actually, that one's surprising. I thought for sure that was Danny Elfman. Well, he did the theme. A lot of those things, you know, they change. Like he didn't compose maybe necessarily the entire movie, but he does that main Harry Potter theme. And I think he he composed the first Superman movie. But then that that main theme that we know of Superman is credited to him, even though the rest of the movies I don't think he ever composed. But they use John Williams theme, if you will. Wow. I mean, yeah, those are those are iconic themes that that I can instantly call to mind when you bring them up. I mean, absolute earworms. 
Mm. Matt K at this point has been stumped. He's 0 for 6. Um, all I can say, Matt, is we'll try again next week. Yeah, this is an easy game. I, can we do Stump the Movie Guy next week? Like maybe I'll ask you a bunch of questions and see how you do. Once you get one right, we'll flip it. How's that all right. sound? All right, fair enough. All well, you got to do is get that, one right. That's so unfair because now that you know that that's the case, you're just going to make them harder. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, brings us to the end of a great job. Indeed. First and foremost – we got to thank Matt K for playing Stump Matt K. Yeah, and thanks to Ride the Movie Guy for writing impossible questions. <laughs> um, Jawheads, thanks for sticking with us through these uh, Skype podcasts. Obviously not our normal quality, but uh, still want to get the podcast out to the Jawheads. Yeah, we're working on improving this, and I'm sure we'll be back in the studio just as soon as we can be. We also want to thank our sponsors. Yep. Thanks to Overcast and Jiffy On Demand and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get great sponsors like them. If you want to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so is by writing us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And while you're at it, please click subscribe. It's one extra button and it helps us out tremendously. Until next week, I'm Rye the Movie Guy. I'm Matt K. And keep and on jawing about, about the movies. About the movies.